Okay, so we're looking at this text written to this city that most of us have never heard of outside of the Bible, Thyatira. This is, if, you, if you've been here before through Revelation, you might remember we put up a picture of the churches that John is writing to, and they kind of make a horseshoe. Uh, Pergamum was the tip of the horseshoe, and now we're coming back down, and now we're looking at the church in Thyatira. Similar to the letter to Pergamum, John is using the Old Testament to make a point. Uh, he actually uses the Old Testament more than any other New Testament author. He's constantly alluding to the Old Testament. But like the letter to Pergamum, he says, well, there's this Old Testament situation which is going to shed light on the New Testament situation. To Pergamum, it was Balaam and Balak. Balaam was entertaining the notion of cursing the Israelites. And though he appeared to be a good guy, the Old Testament reveals he was a bad guy. And so the letter to Pergamum says, don't be like Balak. Don't entertain these notions from false teachers. Similarly, to the church in Thyatira, Jesus says, well, you have one there who is Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is not, almost certainly not, the actual name of an individual in Thyatira who is teaching false things. And the reason we can almost certainly conclude that this is not the name of an individual person in Thyatira is because it's very clearly alluding to an Old Testament person, just like Balaam and Balak in the previous letter were referring to Old Testament people. So to understand, like with the last letter, what John's talking about, we need to look at what he's referring to. Who is Jezebel? Jezebel was an Old Testament person who married a king of Israel, and through this alliance with Israel, this foreigner, Jezebel, through this alliance with Israel, started to do damage to Israel. So it was a, an appearance of love, an appearance of kindness, an appearance of someone saying, I want to be part of your group, part of Israel, part of your nationality, part of your religion, but then subversively attacking the people of Israel. And Jesus says you have a similar thing going on in Thyatira. Let's look specifically at Jezebel. First see her in 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29. So we're going to real quickly get the, the highlights of Jezebel. You, you could read from this point all the way up through 2 Kings to get the full story, but I'm just going to select some highlights here. The first one, 1 Kings 16, verse 29, says, Now Ahab, that's the king. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of, son of Omri, did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all those who were before him. So Ahab is clearly a evil king. This is actually, by most accounts, the most evil king that Israel had ever had. Verse 31. Now it happened as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took Jezebel the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, as a wife, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So you see what's happening here is Jezebel comes and marries Ahab, and just like God had warned the Israelites over and over and over again, don't marry foreign wives, because even though you think you're going to bring them in and they're going to start worshipping me, the opposite's going to happen. You're going to bring them in and they're going to take you out, and you're going to worship their gods, and that's what Ahab, the king of Israel, did. He started worshipping Baal. Look at chapter 18, verse 4. And it happened that when Jezebel was cutting down the prophets of Yahweh, Obadiah took 100 prophets and hid them by 50s in a cave and sustained them with bread and water. So very quickly after Jezebel marries Ahab, he starts worshiping pagan gods. And if that weren't enough, his wife starts killing the prophets of Yahweh, so much so that one of the leaders of the prophets has to hide them in caves by 50s. So this is obviously a very evil woman. Look at chapter 18, verse 40. Then Elijah, the good prophet, 
said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, that's Jezebel's prophets, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. So now God's prophet, in response to Jezebel, God's prophet Elijah takes Jezebel's prophets and slaughters them. So now you have war going on between Jezebel, who's in, in the confines of Israel, and Elijah, one of the most well-known prophets. They're doing war with one another, killing each other's prophets. And you see in chapter 19, starting in verse 1, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed the, all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by about this time tomorrow. And so Jezebel hears that Elijah had killed her prophets, and she says, Okay, Elijah, you're next. So this is no different than someone saying, I'm going to kill Moses or David or Abraham or Jesus Christ himself. This is one of God's anointed ones. Elijah is a good prophet. He's a man of God. And Jezebel is saying, I'm going to kill him. And she's saying that from the throne room of the king of Israel. So this is an extremely wicked stage in the life of Israel. And the key player in this wickedness is Jezebel. She's worked her way into this weak man, Ahab, who should be protecting Israel from idolatry, but he marries idolatry. He allows her to usurp his authority, and then after she marries him, instead of him taking her to Yahweh, she takes him to Baal, and then she starts ruling, essentially, from his throne. So, as we look at Jesus speaking to Thyatira, with that in the background, what do we see? Well, if we flip back to Revelation, the first thing that we notice is that this Jezebel, who is, again, not a specific person, but is this teaching, there's probably some sort of movement going on. We don't know exactly what's happening, but something was going on in Thyatira where people... Uh, whether it was a single person or a movement, were saying, you need to distance yourself from the word of God. You need to distance yourself from what God has taught you to do. Just like Jezebel said, hey, you know, I want to be part of Israel, but you need to distance yourself from Yahweh and worship Baal as well. And you need to not listen to Elijah, Yahweh's prophet. You need to listen to the prophets of Baal. Same thing's going on here. There's this spirit blowing through the church at Thyatira, and what is this spirit saying? Well, it says in verse 20, this is what she's doing. The woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess is teaching and deceiving my slaves so that they commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Verse 20. Okay, let's look at both of those things. We'll look at them in reverse order. We've already seen both of those things. Those things were mentioned in the letter to the church at Pergamum in the 14th verse. Same two sins. Sexual immorality, things sacrificed to idols. Let's look at things sacrificed to idols first and then sexual immorality. If you're a real dedicated student of the Bible, if you're really familiar with the, your New Testament, that might be a little strange to hear that eating things sacrificed to idols was a sin. Because you may know that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 that eating things sacrificed to idols is in fact not a sin in and of itself. And his rationale is that there is no such thing as idols. They're fake, figments of the imagination. If so, if someone goes and makes a sacrifice to Zeus, Zeus is a figment of the imagination. So there, you're not actually doing anything by eating that meat. So let's look at that. How, how do we square these two things? That's in 1 Corinthians 8. And look at verse 4. Paul says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one. You skip down to verse 8. But food will not commend us to God. We neither lack if we do not eat nor abound if we do eat. Right? So Paul is saying, listen, these idols are not real. If you eat something sacrificed to an idol, God is not going to look at you and condemn you because you've done something sinful. This is all a figment of the idolater's imagination. However, look at chapter 10, 
starting in verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this meat is consecrated to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. So what is Paul saying here. Paul is saying, yes, it's not a sin to eat food sacrificed to idols, but there are some people who do believe that idols are real, even though they're wrong. And so they think that eating food sacrificed to an idol is a sin because they think these idols are real. So therefore, even though it's not a sin in and of itself, Paul says, when you're around them, don't do it anyways. Paul's point is, it's not a sin in and of itself, but it's a sin if you're burdening someone's conscience. And it's a sin if you think it's a sin. An analogy would be alcohol, right? Alcohol is not a sin. It's not a sin to drink alcohol. But if you think God is telling you, hey, you got a problem with alcohol, don't drink, and then you have a sip of beer, that's a sin for you. Because to you, it's a sin. So the Paul's point is obey your conscience. God has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us these consciences. Th- drinking alcohol is not a sin in and of itself, but God guides us all down d- different paths, and for some of us, it's a sin. And Paul says, if somebody else thinks it's a sin, whether it's food sacrificed to an idol or drinking alcohol, and I'm around that person, I'll never eat meat again. Why? For the sake of that person's, person's conscience. That's meat sacrificed to idols. That's the New Testament teaching. So generally, the teaching is actually, even though it's not a sin, don't do it. Why? Because conscience is so important in Christianity. So when we look at the letter to Thyatira and what Jezebel is doing, what we notice, you know, we we see sexual immorality. We know what that is. We say, oh, that's a big deal. But food sacrificed to idols, that was actually, if there was anything that wasn't a big deal, that would be it. Eating, it's not even a sin to eat the food. Paul says it's not a sin to do it. It's just about other people's consciences. But look at what he's saying to Thyatira. He's saying Jezebel is teaching you to sin, and this sin is eating food sacrificed to idols. So what do we notice about that? We notice that Jesus, as he's speaking to his church, he has a very high standard. Jesus does not say, hey, this is not that big of a deal. This is okay over here. You know what? It's not even really a sin to eat food sacrificed to idols. That's their problem over there. They think it's a sin, but it's not. So just do whatever you want, and they'll deal with it. What does Jesus say? He says, no, even though it's not a sin, sin is so important that I want you to avoid even the appearance of it. And if you don't, there are consequences. So we need to ask ourselves, does this approach to sin map with our experience of the church. Do we experience the church this way? Do we approach the church this way? Do we hear preaching that preaches this way that says sin is really serious and we need to avoid it at all costs? And the biblical response to sin is not to say, well, that's fine. If, as long as you think it's okay, you do that. I'm going to extend some grace. I'm going to turn a look away. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Just do whatever you need to do. Does that map with what Jesus, our Lord, says to the church? Well, obviously, it does not. A corollary of this point, I think, is something that's a discussion that's happening today in the church, and that's the question of going to so-called gay weddings, right? Some Christians argue it's not a sin to go to a gay wedding because you want to maintain that relationship with that gay person so that you can eventually share the gospel and see that they're converted. And other people say, well, this is to participate in sin. And I think the argument for food sacrificed to idols is helpful in this regard because the New Testament says, even if it's not a sin, don't do it. Why? Because it might look like sin to somebody else. And so if I attend a gay wedding with the purpose of sharing the gospel and seeing these people saved, but people look at me sitting there while a so-called pastor is, is solemnizing a so-called wedding between two people of the same gender, something that I allegedly think is an abomination before the Lord, yet I sit there What are people going to think when they look at me? They're going to think, well, he must be okay with this. But the Bible says, avoid even the appearance of sin. And so I 
respectfully disagree with fellow Christians who think that we should attend these weddings in order to, to bridge the gap. No, what Christ has to say to the church is that we should avoid all, even, even the scintilla of sin, even the smallest amount. And so the more prominent sin is not just the food sacrificed to idols, but it's like it says in verse 20, committing sexual immorality. And again, 1 Corinthians will help us understand this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. So we just saw that food sacrifice to idols, if anything wasn't a big deal, it'd be food sacrifice to idols. Yet Jesus still says this is, this is a problem. But look at sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Let's see if this sin is a big deal. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The Apostle Paul was a Jewish man. He was a devout Jew, and the pinnacle of Jewish life is the temple. You make pilgrimages to the temple. You prayed towards the temple. Your hope was in the temple. When the evading armies came in, they wanted to destroy the temple. God dwelled in the temple. You loved the temple. And in Paul's mind, for a devout Jewish man, going up to the temple with a sledgehammer and damaging it would be absolutely unthinkable. Yet he says this is what sexual immorality is. It is to damage our own bodies. And the importance of it is that God dwells within us. Our bodies are temples. And it's just like going up to the glorious temple of God and taking a sledgehammer to it, putting cracks in it. This is a very big deal. Now, this is not to say that a sexual sin, God looks at it and says, well, people who have sexual sins are in this special camp over here, and people who have heterosexual sins or, or greediness or covetousness, they're in a different camp. All sin is damnable before God. But the Bible says that sexual sin has a heightened potency. It's like poison, right? Greediness it has the ability to kill you slowly, but sexual sin can kill you quickly. It's a stronger poison. It's very important. And so if Jesus looks at the th church in Thyatira and says, meat sacrifice to idols, even though people recognize not a big deal, how much more sexual sin? How much more serious is this sin that Christ is referring to when he looks at the church in Thyatira? But he says Jezebel is trying to convince them to partake of this sin, this egregious sin. Well, what's Jezebel's goal we see in verse 24 that allegedly, apparently, Jezebel, whether it's a person or this movement, they were teaching something that Jesus calls the deep things of Satan. He says, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not have this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. What are the deep things of Satan? There's, there's essentially two views on this. One view says that the deep things of Satan was this teaching that said, in order to best fight Satan, what we need to do is just go into the heart of the beast and do all the things that Satan tells us to do. So go to the temple and visit temple prostitutes and eat food sacrificed to idols and just do all these satanic things and therefore we'll know Satan better and we can fight him. That's one view. The problem with that view is there's no evidence that that's what was being taught. That's just a guess. I think a much better view is evident in the text itself and that is the view that Jezebel was teaching what she claimed to be not the deep things of Satan, but the deep things of God. And what Jesus is doing is saying, though Jezebel says, here's the deep things of God, what Jesus says is these are actually the deep things of Satan. Right? We see him do that precise thing in an earlier letter. He says to the, uh, he says that the church in uh, Ephesus is dealing with these people who are attacking them, and though they claim to be a synagogue, they are actually a synagogue of Satan. 
You see that in chapter 2, verse 9. Excuse me, the, the church in Smyrna. He says, these people say they are Jews, and they are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. So they say, hey, we're Jews, and we're not a synagogue. What does Jesus say? No, they're not really Jews. They're not Jews, and it's not really a synagogue of God. It's a synagogue of Satan. That's probably what's happening here with Jezebel. Jezebel says, I'm going to teach you the deep things of God. That's exactly what Paul calls them in 1 Corinthians 2.10. He says, these are the deep things of God. The, the Gnostic people around this time, they would write books to each other and say, these are the deep things of God. That's a phrase that people would use. But Jesus is saying, though she's trying to teach you what she claims are the deep things of me, they're actually the deep things of my enemy. Well, what are some of these deep things of God? Well, we don't know for sure that this is what Jezebel teaches, but we do know today that the spirit of Jezebel teaches this. We hear many people say that the deep things of God teach us that though the Bible on the surface may claim or seem to claim that homosexuality is a sin, if you go deeper below those texts to the deep things of God, you will discern that actually God says homosexuality is a beautiful thing when done in the right way. This is the argument of a man named Matthew Vines. He wrote a book called God and the Gay Christian. This book describes Matthew Vines as the founder of the Reformation Project, which is a Bible-based nonprofit organization that seeks to reform the church. Bible-based, Reformation Project. What is his reformation? Well, the title of the book is God and the Gay Christian, The Biblical Case in Support of Same-Sex Relationships. So what is he doing? He's saying, hey, I'm a reformer. Hey, I have the Bible. Hey, let me show you the deep things of Scripture. What does he say? On page 12, he says, As I became more aware of same-sex relationships, I couldn't understand why they were supposed to be sinful or why the Bible apparently condemned them. Same-sex relationships were not harmful to anyone. They were characterized by positive motives and traits instead like faithfulness, commitment, mutual love, and self-sacrifice. So what's he saying here? He's saying, well, the Bible might appear to say that these things are sin, but what is the Bible really after? What's the deep things of God? Well, the deep things of God are, look at the fruit. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruit. So we might say, well, this activity seems sinful, but that's a surface level reading of the Bible. What you need to go is into the deep things of God and look at the hearts of these people and say, well, are they producing fruit? Are these people loving? Are they faithful to one another? Are they joyful? Well, if that's what's going on, then the deep things of God would indicate to us that this is good. That's the argument. While it ignores the biblical prohibitions against homosexuality, which we don't have time to go into, which we've talked about before. There's a lot of places in the Bible that explicitly and 100% clearly say this is a sin, so it ignores that. But let's just assume that the Bible was silent about homosexuality. Let's just say, well, is this argument on its own sufficient? Ignoring all those verses, which are enough in their own right. Is it enough to say, well, let's look at the fruit? Well, let's look at what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira. Look at the 19th verse. I know your deeds. That could loosely be translated, I know your fruits. And your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your last deeds or fruits are greater than at first. This church had the greatest fruits of any of the churches that John is writing to. I mean, this is the full package, right? You remember Ephesus, they were doing pretty good. They had really good doctrine. They were rejecting the heretical Nicolaitans, but they lost their first love. So Jesus was like, hey, you got good doctrine, but that's not all. That's ha you're halfway there. You need to have love, too. You got to actually love people, otherwise your doctrine is dead. James talks about that. But not so with Thyatira. Thyatira, they, they got love. They got faith. They got service. Not only that, but they persevere in these things. It wasn't like a fit and a start. They didn't do it for a little bit and then quit, but they're persevering. And then most amazingly of all, not only are they persevering, but your last deeds are greater than at first. They're growing in their fruits. I mean, this is the full package. They've got it all. Their fruits are not only there, but their fruits are growing. Jesus should leave Thyatira alone. They've got fruit. Hey, your fruit are good. So we don't need to look at your conduct, but that's not what Christ says. Verse 20, but I have this against you. 
What does that mean? It means that though you have the fruit, it's not enough. Well, what were they failing to do? You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. You're tolerating this person who is speaking to you on behalf of God, claiming to teach you the deep things of God, but who is actually trying to murder my prophets. Yet so many in the situation that we are in today, they want to say, well, just look at the fruit. Just look at the fruit. They're happy. They're smiling. They're smiling. They're loving. They go out and do community service. They, they work in the praise band. They sweep up after. They're the hardest working people in our church. Well, what would Jesus have to say to them? That's great. You love. You have faith. You have service and perseverance. But if you're tolerating Jezebel, you're an enemy of the church. This is what the letter to Thyatira means. This is what is happening in the CRC. We have this spirit of Jezebel in the denomination saying these things. Look at the fruit. Just look at the fruit. I know the Bible seems to say this is wrong, but look at the fruit. When in reality, Jesus looks at that and says, watch out. This is extremely dangerous. So who is this talking to Thyatira? Right? Is it just this nice Jesus with flowing blonde hair and blue eyes with high cheekbones and blush put on and a little bit of makeup and a flowing purple robe. Is that who's speaking? Well, let's, let's look at who's speaking. Verse 18. This is what the Son of God, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says. First of all, this is an allusion to Daniel. Jesus, th th those descriptions come right out of the book of Daniel. He's saying, the one prophesied in Daniel, I'm he. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, this is not the uh, pale Jesus with a man bun, right? This is the, the God who has eyes of flames of fire. And for John's context, and for in between John's context and today, and for our context today, and for any other context or nation, anywhere you go, anytime you ask somebody, what does it mean when somebody has fire in their eyes? Everybody understands, whether you're Chinese or American or African or ancient, Near Eastern, everybody knows it means you're angry. Christ is not flippant about this. He's not saying it's not a big deal. He's not saying let's have a conversation and tell me how you feel about it. He's not saying I want to hear your story of your experience of this sin and tell me how good it makes you feel and maybe I'll change my mind. He's got fire in his eyes and not only that but his feet are burnished bronze. Not like the clay feet of the nations surrounding Daniel when this was first written, but his feet are burnished bronze. He's not going to fall. He can't throw a stone and get him to fall down. He's not moving. He's steadfast and immovable. His feet are burnished bronze. He's not going anywhere. You're not going to change his mind. He's not going to turn around. This is the Christ who's speaking. So this is not a time for conversation today. This is not a time to just give grace. This is not a time to wait but this is a time to stand with Christ and to call those who are in the Christian Reformed Church to repentance. Amen. If we want to be faithful to Jesus Christ as his servants, we must do like our master does. We can't say, let's sit down and talk about this. We can't say, I want to hear your story. We can't say, let me go back and study the Bible some more. We can't say we're going to make a study committee that's going to go study this for a year. But we need to stand with feet immovable and with fire in our eyes, yet with love in our hearts, and say this sin must be repented of. You see, in verse 29, Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this is the, th this has already been stated in Revelation we're going to see this again. There's a total of eight times where Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Eight times in Revelation. And I think it's really interesting that Jesus says that eight times in Revelation, and he also says that eight times in the Gospels. Revelation 2, verse 7, 11, 17, 29, chapter 3, verse 6, 13, 22. Eight times in Revelation. And then Matthew eleven fifteen. 15, Matthew 13, 9, verse 43, Mark 4, 9, and verse 23, and chapter 7, 16, Luke 8, 8, and 14, 35. Eight times in each. And I think that's a, a subtle signal because a lot of people hear Jesus' voice, and what do they say? That's not really Jesus' voice. 
Jesus is so loving. Look at how nice he was to the women of the city. And she's wiping his feet with her tears. And he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus' voice is not repent. But rather, Jesus' voice is relent. Just lay back and let them do what they're doing. That's Jesus' voice. But he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says the churches. And that's supposed to signal. This is precisely the same voice of the Gospels. From Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is Christ's voice. And we need to heed it. And what does Christ's voice say? This authenticated voice, the one who stands with feet like bronze, with eyes like flames of fire, who says, this is my voice. Listen to me. What does he have to say? To this church that's tolerating this food sacrifice to idols, this quote-unquote sin that's not a big deal, and this sexual immorality that everybody knows is a big deal. What does he say to them? Look at verse 21. And I gave her time to repent, and she does not wish to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. These are sobering words from the Lord of glory, from the King of kings. This is is the result of this sin. Whether it's people in the Christian Reformed Church or people in different churches, if we do not repent of these sins, this is God's promise for us. We will be thrown on a bed of sickness. There will be great tribulation. Our children will be killed with pestilence. What Christ is referring to here is he's going to cut off the progeny of those who teach these false doctrines. Right now, these false doctrines grow. Right now, if you teach things like this, you get a book deal, and you get to go on TV, and CNN and, and the Washington Post will interview you. But Jesus is saying, though it looks like they're having a lot of children now, there's a lot of converts going to this line of teaching. Jesus says, if they do not repent, their children will be killed. There will be a day when all of this false teaching will be eviscerated. It will be ended. It will cease forever. Now, you might remember when we were looking at the letter to the church in Pergamum, in the 16th verse, Jesus says, Repent, or I'm coming with the sword of my mouth. You might remember that we said, That's not talking about the second coming. We won't rehash why that is, but if you remember, there's reasons why we know this is not the second coming. And he says, I'm coming again. So what does that mean? Well, it means he has to be coming not in the second coming sense, but he has to be coming through his church. He has to be coming through his people. And how does he come? Through the sword of his mouth. What's the sword of his mouth? His word. So what's he saying? If you don't repent, my word is going to come and make war with you. What does that mean? It means that if, for example, the Christian Reformed Church does not repent of this sexual sin, Christ will return through his word, and his word will make war with people in the Christian Reformed Church. And the application we made for that last week was, if you're a member of the Christian Reformed Church and you have a problem with this, I think you're disobeying God if you leave and just go start another denomination. You need to make war with those who are committing these sins with the sword of Christ's mouth. Just leaving is like being a Pharisee who sees the Samaritan in the road and just walks around. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be clean. We need to do war. And it's the same thing we he see here in the letter to the church in Thyatira. He says, I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Well, if we care about the church of Christ, how could we possibly just walk away when we have this letter from Jesus himself who's saying, I'm going to kill this church. How could we possibly walk away and say, well, go ahead, Jesus, kill him. I'm going to go join another one. The only logical response in a situation like this, if we truly care about Christ's church, if we truly care about people, if we're not going to make the sin of Ephesus and have good doctrine but no love, the only rational response to such a situation is to open our mouths and to speak to people who are eating food, sacrificed idols, who are committing sexual immorality and tolerating the teaching of Jezebel and telling them, repent, because Christ hates this sin. We must do this. 
Look at 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 33. And we'll see the result of Jezebel's sin. Second Kings 9, verse 33. This is speaking about Jezebel. This is her fate for sinning against God's people. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. Then he came in and ate and drank, and he said, Take care now of this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. They went to bury her, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they returned and declared it to him, and he said, This is the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the property of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel will be as dung on the face of the field and the property of Jezreel, so they cannot even say, this is Jezebel. This is a very serious matter. The spirit of Jezebel is not only blowing through the Christian Reformed Church, It's in many other denominations, and it's not just in the church, but it's outside the church. This spirit is present, and this is the end of that spirit. And we cannot simply hunker down in our bomb shelters and just wait. We have to tell people about the result of their sin. We have to tell them where they're headed. That's their end, ultimate and utter destruction. We have to warn people about this, not just go start other churches, not just talk about it with people who agree with us, but we need to talk to them, and we need to tell them, this is the result of your sin, because this is what Christ commands us to do, and he tells us that if we do this, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, here's the result if we do this. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father. This is astounding. If you have the LSB, you see it's in capital letters. Why? Because this is an Old Testament quotation. What quotation is this? It's from Psalm chapter 2. What is Psalm chapter 2 about? Jesus. That Psalm chapter 2 is a messianic prophecy about Christ. And Christ says, if you will do this, if you will speak these words to Jezebel instead of giving into her sin, but if you will be bold and speak to her, then Jesus says, the prophecy that was concerning me will also apply to you. Not only has Christ been given authority over the nations, he will give you authority over the nations. Not only does Christ have a rod of iron that he rules with, but he will give you a rod of iron to rule with under him as his prince. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, you will rule. As, and he says also, as I've received authority from my uh, father, he will grant that authority to us. This is extremely serious, not just in the height of the sin, but in the potential that we have for greater degrees of glory. Christ's church will reign. It will rule the earth. Christ's church, he rules the earth through his church. And insofar as the church plays with Jezebel and commits harlotry with her, the church will be eroded and one day be completely eviscerated so that all that you can see left are the hands and feet and it's like dung spread across the field. But if the church will follow Christ, the church will rule the earth like Christ does. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. The morning star here is a reference to himself. Look at Revelation 22, verse 16. What is this morning star that Christ will give? Revelation 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, sent my angel to bear witness to you of these things 
for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Make no mistake that on this doctrine, on this command of Christ, the church stands or falls. And not only does the church stand or fall, but so does your reception of Christ himself. If you give in to Jezebel, you do not have the morning star. You do not have Christ. But if you will stand firm on God's word and speak God's truth, Christ says, I'll give you myself. So how could we possibly even contemplate playing with Jezebel, knowing that in so doing, we are liable to give up Christ himself? Could there be anything more foolish, more horrendous, for somebody who claims to be saved by the precious blood of Christ to say, I am willing to forsake the morning star to go commit harlotry with Jezebel. There is nothing more abominable than that. And we, those of us who understand the stakes of this game, must speak out and spread this message. This message is not just for Thyatira. It's for the Christian Reformed Church. And many of us stand by and we don't play with Jezebel. And Jesus says in verse 24, I place no other burden on you. He says, this is great. You're doing good. But hold fast, verse 25. Hold fast. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Will you hold fast to that truth? And holding fast doesn't mean holding it and hiding it. But hold fast means publicly proclaiming this is the truth, and I will hold fast to it. What did Martin Luther do when he held fast to the truth? Did he just stay in his little cloistered monastery, huddled together with a bunch of little monks, and never tell anybody that the Roman Catholic Church was teaching heresy? How did Martin Luther hold fast to the church? He stood in front of the emperor of the whole empire, and the emperor said, Recanter, you're dead. And what did Luther say? How did he hold fast to the truth? Here I stand, I can do no other. I don't care if the whole Roman Empire is filled with demons. I'm going to hold fast to this truth publicly. Will we stand in that line? Will we be the Christian Reformed Church? Will we stand firm in our biblical heritage to stand behind the word of God in the midst of people who are listening to the siren song of Jezebel whispering in their ears, will we go hide with our doctrine like the Ephesians without love and hold it in our bunkers? Or will we follow Christ and his emissaries like Paul and Luther and go out and speak out and say, this is the truth. We must repent of this because if we do, the reward could not be greater. What is giving up a life of sexual satisfaction compared to inheriting the morning star. Jesus Christ himself. This is not even a question. It's not even up for debate. There is no comparison between the two. A few years of momentary satisfaction versus eternity in his courts, in his presence, beholding his face, looking at the one who died on the cross, knowing my sins intimately in each one, but doing that because of his love, seeing him and seeing him look at me and love me. What, what, what is giving up my life compared to that? But we share this message. Let's pray and ask God that we would. Lord, my heart is burdened for your church. You died for your people. Yet Jezebel is whoring ar around with your children, enticing them to follow after her. And her plan is not just for a few minutes of fun, but it's to kill your prophets. Oh Christ, would you enable your prophets to stand up and to speak out? Would you enable us who have weak knees and and spines like jellyfish, would you enable us to be strong and to stand on your word and to speak out, not with anger, not with pride, not because for even for a moment that we think that we're better than even the most wretched sinner on the face of the earth, but only because we love Christ, but only because we know that without Christ, the church will fall. No matter what the book writers say, 
No matter what Jezebel says, would you encourage us and strengthen us to do this for the sake of your precious bride, the one that you love, the one that you're washing. Would you wash her in the water of your word and make her pure so that one day she might be united to you in great glory? We pray this, Lord, not because we are worthy, not because we are able to avoid sinning, not because we even deserve for you to speak to us, but only because you are the bright morning star, the one who stands with hair white like wool, with eyes like flames of fire, with a golden sash around his waist, with feet and arms like burnished bronze, who holds a rod that rules all the nations, And that out of your mouth comes the pure and perfect word, sharper than any two-edged sword. We worship you, Jesus Christ. Would you strengthen us to do so more? We pray this in your name. Amen.